them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the utmost parts of the earth. Praise the Lord that the Holy Spirit gives us the power to witness. Amen?
King of kings.
Yep, I got it. I got it, Dave. Never mind. I got it. Thank you. The majestic and stately words as the deacons brought forward the collection plates just prior to the dedication prayer. If you are my generation, you surely remember the words of the poem. And the words are going to be on the screen momentarily, and I'll just wait till we get everything set. Yes. Why don't you just say them with me? Or if you know the music, you could even sing it. Uh, but if not, a good voice uh, quietly. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Unfortunately, you can't say Holy Spirit because spirit doesn't rhyme with host. This, uh, it may surprise you that this doxology, uh, this po obviously a poem, is not scripture. Although it has probably been recited more than any scripture for the last 300 years in the Protestant church. Uh, the words of the prayer were written around 1674 by Thomas Ken, an Anglican bishop. And he wrote it as the conclusion to three prayers that his college students would pray during their private devotions at morning, evening, and midnight. Each of the prayers had about 14 verses but all three prayers ended up with the doxology. Ended up with the words, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Now the, the message of the doxology echoes the message of James in the words of our scripture today. James, the brother of Jesus, uh, is writing his one and only letter to the early Christians. And the background of this letter was that the Christians were experiencing trials and tribulations from every direction. Immediately after his greeting, James writes in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. From other parts of the letter, we get the idea that these trials included economic oppression, actual physical fights, and sickness. And these Christians were going through some tough times, and the letter was written as a, an encouragement, and uh, it, was in, it was supposed to bring hope to those people who were suffering. Looking back on 2020, it's reasonable to say that we also have been through some suffering. I have a friend who says he's staying up late on New Year's Eve night, not so much to welcome the new year in as to make sure that the old one really leaves on time. <laughs> Were it that simple? <clears throat> no one has escaped the grip of the pandemic, but some have been hurt far more than others. But it has been a year of fear, anger, inequality, lies, loneliness, and loss. When we live in challenging times, it is tempting for the Christian to feel sorry for himself. As we allow circumstances from the outside to affect our inner spirit, discontent and frustration rob us of our peace and joy and patience. And to those of us who feel this way, James says in verse 112, blessed is the man, the woman, who endures. And so let's continue to meet the challenges head on. Let's stick it out until help arrives. And help is on the way. I was thinking about that as being a wonderful motto for life. 
Help is on the way. If you are a believer in God, help is always on the way, is it not? And sometimes human help is also on the way too. But I move on. The epistle of James also suggests that Christians enduring tough times can be tempted to blame God for what is happening. And this must have been a real problem. For James says at the beginning of our scripture that he does not want us to be deceived about this. He writes that God is not the author of bad things. Never think that God is out to get you. Uh, let me say that again. Never think that God is out to get you. He, James says the bad things that happen in this life are not the fault of God. They are the fruits or the consequences of our evil desires. Sinful actions begin with a human desire which might look innocuous at first, but eventually will bring death. Now in this verse, it's very interesting. James is not blaming Satan for sin. He, keeps, he leaves that out. Instead, he focuses on our individual responsibility. We've got sin within us. <clears throat> we would be sinners even if there were not a Satan. Have you ever thought about that? James says, God is never going to bring evil to you. And the scripture for today paints a beautiful picture of God, where God is the source of every good and perfect gift that pertains to life. And while our human desires, our sinful desires and our human nature are the source of evil, and we are constantly in an unstable situation, <clears throat> fluctuating back and forth, our, div our divine Father sustains us with uninterrupted blessings. James presents a worldview where God is the steady hand, the reliable and constant provider. To this end, James writes this, that God is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. To understand this title of God, we must go back to the beginning when God created the sun and the moon, one to rule the day, the other to rule the night, and the sun would never vary in providing light aside from the seasonal changes that would affect times of sunrise and sunset. The full sun would always face the earth. It might be behind clouds, but it's always there, and it doesn't change, although astrophysicists say that the sun does vary in some intensity from time to time. But from a biblical perspective, and the point that James is trying to make is that the sun is that steady state. But the moon is very different, is it not? The moon is variable from night to night as it goes through its five or eight phases, depending on how precise you want to be. And each phase of the moon, caused by the shadow of the turning earth, affects the amount of reflected light either more or less. James is telling us that God is as constant as the sun in his character and behavior toward us. You don't have to wake up in the morning worrying if the sun is going to be there. Indeed, there is enough hydrogen in the sun to keep it stable for another 4 billion years, the scientists tell us. So the sun isn't going away. And God isn't going away. No matter what kind of trials and tribulations you are experiencing, no matter what kind of year we've had, God has not changed his attitude toward you. Now, this biblical message, indeed, this very text, was written and paraphrased 
by a man named Thomas Chilson, who wrote the beloved hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Thomas was raised in Kentucky, born in 1866, became a school teacher, was converted at age 27, and decided he would become a Methodist preacher. He could only last one year due to his health problems. And so he spent the rest of his life selling life insurance and writing beautiful poems, 1,200 of them, about God. Great is thy faithfulness is probably his favorite. It may be your favorite, too. So all these good and perfect gifts provided by a faithful God are for our benefit. But the greatest gift of all, according to James, is the gift of salvation, where we become part of God's new creation. You see, these first-generation Christians, even though they were being tested and tried, were the first fruits, James's words, of God's new society. So instead of blaming God, James tells us to bless God. Now the giving nature of God certainly includes the gifts that Jesus gives us, gives the congregation or gives his people as we read in Ephesians 4 verse 7. But to each one of us, Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. These spiritual gifts operating in the congregation are intended to create a new and better society. They, they speak, the, these people will speak the truth in love. They will grow up in the fullness of Christ. They will exhibit efficiency, effectiveness, and they will edify everything they do. You see, these perfect and good gifts from God will result in a fully integrated people. And when you read Jesus and when you read Paul, they envision the new utopian society that philosophers have always dreamed of, but which humanity has never quite been able to achieve. In the Sabbath school lesson this week, we were reminded that God's gifts are also artistic, mechanical, and handcraft skills. For example, in the construction of the wilderness sanctuary, we read in Exodus these words, I have filled, he mentions the name, Bezael, with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold, in silver, in bronze. And so we can tell from these texts, we, we can visualize Jesus and God doing everything they can to enhance our life, to expand the kingdom of God, and to excel in ways that will give glory to God as J.S. Bach would scribble on the end of his compositions, soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. Which was his way of saying, praise God from whom all blessings flow. In this regard, the words of John the Baptist have a profound ring to them. Give me a moment to give you the setting, the background, the context. It happens very early in Jesus' ministry, and John's disciples notice that their, cloud, their crowds are slacking down as Jesus is, uh, becomes increasingly popular with the people. And with a little sanctified eye imagination, I imagine that these disciples of John saw a problem that needed to be fixed. And so they report the situation to John, and they recommend several ways of, of bringing the crowds back. Such as, for example, Hey John, why don't we offer some free scrolls 
And we can have drawings and, and people can kind of get excited about the message again. And you can even sign the scrolls. Or, hey, John, why don't you start a healing ministry that will complement your preaching ministry? Or, hey, John, rather than having the people come out to you in the desert, why don't we relocate in Jerusalem? Or, hey, John, perhaps we should tone down the harsh language and get the endorsement of the priests. Well, of course, John isn't impressed with any of these suggestions. And eventually, he says that this is the way it's supposed to be. And he'll end up with the statement, you know it, he must increase, I must decrease. But before he says those words, he says this. And that brings us to the passage I want to look at, the statement for our focus today. Would you read it with me aloud? You can see it on the screen. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. That's really an astounding statement, isn't it? I really didn't even know that existed. I guess I'm reading so fast and I want to get to the he must increase, I must decrease that I don't see this little, this little I, this idea that John's recognition that everything that he was came from heaven. It was a gift. John knew where the gift of his ministry came from. He knew he could not succeed without heaven's help. He knew he, could obtain, he couldn't obtain anything unless it was granted to him from heaven. In other words, the only way to fix the problem of the lost crowds was heaven's fix. And heaven didn't have a fix for that. And so James and Paul and John the Baptist speak of God's constant faithfulness in sustaining life, in receiving salvation, and in advancing the kingdom. And so it is more than a little strange that during the Christmas season, a time when we should be focused on the generosity of God, that we have in our Western Christian tradition the presence of a very complicated person who has divine-like qualities and who dispenses the very gifts that people are asking for. Have you noticed the similarities between Santa and Jesus? The Bible says that God and Jesus know what we do, and, well, that's what people claim about Santa. We pray to Jesus and make requests to him of our needs, and people write letters to Santa, and they sound a lot like prayer requests. The Bible tells the story of Jesus inviting children to sit on his lap and to receive his blessing. And this picture of Lydia, which came to us recently, shows us that this is still a common custom today. The Bible says that before Jesus comes again, he will know who has been bad or good. So does Santa, according to the claim. And so I ask you, is this accidental or is this intentional? Why is Santa so much like Jesus? By the time our son Adam was five, the question of Santa had been pretty much resolved in our family. We told him it was just a story and that Santa did not exist. A few days later, there was a knock on the door, and I was visited by the 10-year-old neighbor boy. He, had, he said that he had been talking with Adam about Santa and that Adam said that he didn't believe. Uh, this young boy was very concerned, and with a serious expression, he told me that we were robbing part of Adam's childhood. 
And I was fearful that he was going to call Child Protective Services on us for being bad parents. We raise these questions about Santa not because we are trying to declare war on Christmas, although I think even Christians would admit that there are cultural traditions that need to be revisited and perhaps eliminated. It's just that we are so pro-God, we are so pro-Christ, that we are concerned about any attempt to create in someone's mind an alternative Jesus, someone who might take his place, someone who might... <clears throat> who we might give credit for, or to, who doesn't deserve it. And worse, <clears throat> that we might even replace Jesus in someone else's life with a myth. I understand people wanting to be well-intentioned, and we need to be gentle, and we need to be kind, and we need to listen carefully. We can't just make declarations but we do need to think reasonably about these things. But as I come to the end of the sermon, I think that the best way of celebrating Christmas is to remember the doxology and to praise God from whom all blessings flow. Don't sing it or, or say it as some kind of formal recitation Please don't speak it as a dirge. Speak it joyfully and with the conviction that no matter what our circumstances might be, no matter how this year has turned out, no matter what we don't have in the way of material things, we do have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The closing hymn is Silent Night.
Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day, a day to celebrate your generosity to us, a gift of time. Please be with your congregation as scattered as it is on the, on the hills of Connecticut. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we continue to advance through this year, as we look forward to remembering and to considering the greatest gift of all, the blessings that flow through Jesus Christ. I ask that you will be with us as a congregation, be with all of our family and our friends. Keep us safe, we pray, and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a wonderful Sabbath. May God bless you. Amen. Mm.